Hi, I'm Caius Tenchi. I'm the uh, founder and director of the TMFF Motorcycle Film Festival. Thanks for joining me tonight. Uh, I am uh, excited to be speaking with Wayne Mitchell and Simon Edwards, two of the characters and cast from Where the Road Ends, um, the film that chronicles, I guess, the adventures of a group of four uh, Army veterans who travel from Prudhomme, Alaska, all the way down to Ushuaia in Argentina via the Darien Gap and um, all the challenges that, that uh, come as a result of that. This film was absolutely one of the most anticipated and talked about films at this year's festival. Anticipated when we released the trailers, we've we always received a lot of comments on that. People couldn't wait to see it. And then once they did see it on screen, uh, well, we just had a lot of great discussions about the film and how much fun it was to, to watch. So I'm excited to... Br to be speaking with uh, Wayne and Simon tonight. So let's bring them online. Hello. Hey, guys. Hi. Hello, Simon. Hello, Wayne. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm really excited for this. Um, I'm just going to, I want to mention that uh, for uh, our audience, if there's somebody that's watching from YouTube or from Facebook, if you've got a question for these two gentlemen or just want to pop in to uh, give a comment about the film, uh, please do so. Put it into the chat and then we'll bring it up on the screen so um, Wayne or Simon can, can answer it. All right. So um, let's see. Where do we start? So <laughs> there's so many things I want to talk about. Why don't we start uh, by asking the question, how did the idea for this trip come about? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I get asked that a lot. Um, I guess, uh, I, well, I first found, I first heard about the Darien Gap um, probably back in 1995, 1996, when I was in college. And, um, my wife's Colombian. So we were at a party and we met this guy. Um, and he told us a story of yeah, his name is Tim Steigen. And he told us a story about in the 1970s, he was on a Jeep expedition and they went from uh, Argentina to Alaska and they actually took the Jeeps through the Darien Gap. So I had never, I hadn't heard of the Darien Gap. I didn't realize at the time that there was no road between Pan Panama and Colombia. Um, <clears throat> so that kind of, that stuck in my brain for quite a while. And uh, I guess it was probably in 2004, I was deployed to Iraq with Mike Eastham. And, uh, you know, we, when you're, when you're, when you have a lot of free time, you sit around <laughs> And you brainstorm, um, you know, ideas, things that you're going to do when you retire and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, things, things to do when you retire. So, um, we got to talking about riding motorcycles from Alaska to Argentina and, uh, you know, you come up with this idea and you're like, oh, well, you know, if we're going to ride from Alaska to Argentina, we have to go through the Darien Gap. We can't go around it. So that idea just sort of snowballed in, um. 2014, I retired from the army. Mike had retired, I think, um, maybe a year later. And we just sort of re dug up the idea and started talking about it. And um, we said, well, we, you know, if we're going to do it, we're going to go through the Darien Gap. And that just sort of <laughs> like we wrote it on the wall and that sort of became the uh, became the plan. And um and then we set out to do it. So once we had it, once we had it written on the wall, it was going to happen one way or the other. How did you rope in, convince the other guys to, to join you on this mission? <laughs> well, Simon, Simon didn't take very much convincing. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that was the uh, easy one. <laughs> yeah. Well, so Mike and I, um, Mike and I had been talking about it for years, but we didn't really realize that that it was a seri that we were seriously going to do it um, until uh, 
probably 2015 or 16, I guess. Um, I met Simon's Simon's mom is actually my next door neighbor. Hmm. And um, we kept passing each other and she kept saying, I kept telling her, Oh, I want to do this motorcycle trip from Alaska to Argentina. And, and we're getting ready. We're going to do it in 2017. And she kept telling me, Oh, well, you need to talk to my son. He's a motorcycle rider and he wants to do the same trip. And so over the course of like six months, Simon and I never actually met. We just kept, uh, we kept communicating through his mom. And, um, once, yeah, once Simon and I actually met, um, I think he might have thought I was a little crazy because I showed up at him and his brother's house and I was like, we're going to, you know, I just started unloading all the information that I had <laughs> planned. And um, interestingly, he was like, all right, <laughs> like, <laughs> when, wh- what's the start date? When do we leave? Yeah. So once we when had he- Simon on board, it was, it was bound to happen. Yeah, it kind of, uh, you meet a lot of people who want to take a trip and but don't have a solid plan or don't have any means or, and, and I met with Wayne and I was like, Oh, this guy, he knows what he's talking about. He's got a plan. He's got an idea. He's got, you know, it's a, it's a lot of work has already been put into the plan before we met. I was like, Oh, this is, this is doable. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a monumental undertaking. Like even if you put away the, the Darien gap portion, just to travel, you know, from the top to the bottom, it's no uh, easy feat. Like there's a lot of logistics that need to be taken care of. Never, you know, the motorcycling part of it and uh, obviously, you know, work and family and the finance part. Like uh, there's, I'm sure, a lot of work that went into that. And then to add in the complexities of uh, northern Alaska and then the Darien Gap, it just raised it to another level. Um, I'm just going to pop in with a comment here from Ed Schnurbush. Hey. Hi, guys. Hey, Ed with the blue gold wing in Northern California here. Just wanted to say congrats on the film release. It was an honor riding the short distance with you both. So that that's pretty awesome. He also then says, still rocking Wayne's safety third sticker on his helmet. Oh, that's Simon's. That's yeah, I know Simon's where that sticker. came from. <laughs> Yeah, Ed was our uh, was our tour guide in California. He took us down some really fantastic roads while we were there. Awesome. Yeah, he, he he took us in some oh, bomber back roads there. It was good fun. Yeah, that guy can ride. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, on a gold well, line for sure. Can ride apparently quite well. So, <clears throat> all four of you. So the other two gentlemen that weren't able to make this call. Um, Mike and Rich, all four of you have uh, armed forces background, right? So Wayne, um, I actually, unfortunately, I apologize. I didn't make a note of what you did in the armed forces. What what was that? Oh, yeah, well, I was, I was enlisted infantry and then okay. I was uh, commissioned as an engineer officer. Okay. And then Simon, you were a physician's assistant, a former special forces uh, medic. Um mm-hmm. And you also hold two land speed records. Still two, yeah. or are we at three now? Two. Two, okay. Yeah. And then Mike, uh, he was squad leader. Rich, uh, who's a geophysicist, served in the Army and then Air Force as a satellite operator. So all four of you have like an armed forces background. And um, obviously, I think this l- that experience having shared you know some common experience there plus the love of motorcycling probably really bonded you guys closer together but in the movie there's this theme that pops up a lot which is uh the challenges with reintegrating into um civilian life like normal civilian life and one of the things that you mention often both of you actually mention often is Um, when you were in the army, you sort of knew what you had to do. You had a purpose, a mission every day, uh, something to, and then having that made things, um, easy, I guess, if I can use that word. And whereas back in civilian life, without having that mission and that daily purpose, it was quite difficult. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? And, um, how that came to be like as a storyline in the movie was that something that you um thought about like is this one of the reasons why this trip and the movie came about well simon i think i'll let you 
take the first half of that question and I'll, uh, okay. I'll jump um, in about the movie stuff. I, I think there's a quote in the movie where I said that my first four years back home from Afghanistan was the worst four years of my life. And that's, that's not hyperbole. That's reality. Um, when I returned from Afghanistan, I yeah, had a horrible time readjusting to, to being back in the world. And, um, I think that difficulty is probably always there with me. Um, that you don't ever plan or prepare to come home. And like Wayne was saying, when you're deployed, you spend a lot of time almost fantasizing about what your life is going to be like when you get home. And it, it never meets your expectations. There's no way that it can. And it, I think trying to find a place to put all the horror and difficulties that you deal with while you're deployed, trying to find a, a way to package that up and deal with it um, is, I, I'll speak for myself, was very difficult for me and, and, and took a long time. Um, and I think uh, motorcycles helped me a lot with that in that I just found a way to try to outrun my demons. Yeah. Did you use motorcycling? I'll get to you in a second, Wayne. Did you use motorcycling as a way to deal with that uh, even before this trip? Oh, oh yeah. I, um, I started motorcycle racing uh, after I got home from the war just to, to find a way to get away. Um, and then I'd made multiple trips across the country here and um, just try to, you know, I, I, it wasn't so much motorcycling. It could have been anything I think that I enjoyed, but I, it was one of the activities that I really found comforting and I enjoyed and I, I found <laughs> exciting. And so it was a good place to, it was a good place to go. And it's a fantastic community. Yeah. And I, I think sure. when you leave the military, that's one of the things you miss the most is that sense of community. Right. That makes sense. Wayne, were you going to add something? You know, I'll, you know, I'll just kind of piggyback on what uh, Simon's saying. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've found, you know, motorcycle riding, you know, just the act of motorcycle riding is very, um, you know, you, you got to focus, you've got to stay very attentive to what you're doing. And that is really relaxing when you're sort of chan channelized into doing just one activity and, and um, you know, you're still experiencing everything that's going on around you, but you're staying, you know, very focused and, and you're kind of, um, you know, outside your head a little bit and, and, you know, to, so the, the film itself, um, to answer your question about the film that kind of came along after the fact it, um, we had planned the trip and I think to some extent it was kind of, um, <clears throat> you know, we didn't necessarily plan it that it was going to be all veterans and all, you know, people that we had worked with. Um, but that was sort of how it shook out. But uh, I think that there was definitely a sense of like, you know, we wanted a community of people that we knew and we had worked around and, and that we had some camaraderie with to go on the, on the trip. Um, I think it was probably, um, it was kind of late in the planning session or the planning um, when when we met Jake Hamby, who was the filmmaker who um, who did all the videography or most of the videography. Uh, he had some friends uh, join him at, at certain parts uh, to do a little bit of filming, but for the most part, it's um, all the movie is made with one guy and a camera huh. um, carrying carrying a backpack and and driving around in a van, <laughs> uh, following us. And um, so the. The, I think the evolution of the film sort of uh, from his standpoint, he is also a, a, a army combat camera um, veteran. And, you know, I think a lot of what you see in the, in the movie that came out in the final product is, is sort of him piecing together that story. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, ultimately I, I mean, I hope other veterans or anybody sees um, anybody that's, you know, dealing with, with uh stress and issues in their lives i mean i hope one of the takeaways is you know get on a motorcycle and 
and uh, and get out and enjoy it because it's very therapeutic. I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think we all, as motorcyclists, we all agree with that for sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> did uh, a question for you? Did the process of documenting your trip, the filming part of it, you know, the probably there's a times where you had to stop and start maybe retake some stuff did that do you think that that interfered with your with your trip well that's a good question i i would <laughs> i'd be curious to hear or maybe um, not even interfered but also just wondering do you think yeah. it affected your experience yeah you know? yeah i mean there's some really great um there's some really great motorcycle films out there and it ranges from you know a full-blown like holly hollywood film experience to you know shaky gopro camera yeah footage um and you know i mean like i like a lot of uh a lot of um i don't know if you're familiar with ed march and the c90 adventures but that's one mm -hmm. of my <laughs> that's one of my favorite channels to watch um, Ed does some great work and that's, you know, that's all filmed, um, by himself. So we're, uh, you know, we were sort of, I guess, uh, a little bit more on the, the, um, production well-produced side of it. We wanted to make sure that we got really good video footage. We took the time to get good, um, drone footage and things like that. Yeah. And so that required that we, and, and it didn't happen that often because, um, like I said, Jake was right there. A lot of times he was sitting on the back of the motorcycle with us or he was sitting in the sidecar getting a lot of that footage. Um, but there were a few times where, you know, we saw a really great shot and we we're like, you know what, let's go back and film that again because, you know, crossing that bridge was really cool. Mm -hmm. Let's try to get all four motorcycles crossing the yeah. bridge at the same time. That'd be really cool. So I would say that it disrupted the flow occasionally, maybe, you know, in a yeah, but, but, it, but I kind of think it's in some ways it made it better because it's like, hey, let's ride that again. You know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's go, go do that yeah. again. <laughs> like, or, 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 hey, Jake, get up ahead of us because Jake had his own bike. He would scoot up ahead of us and be like, hey, man, get up ahead of us because this is going to be this is going to be badass. You know, this is going to be great going through nice. here. Yeah, I mean, there's no question that the uh, cinematography in the film is wonderful. Like, there's some great shots, you know, drones, or even just, like, the whole experience. Like, you do feel like you're there with you guys, whether, you know, it's in the frigid weather of Alaska or in the damp jungle. But um, I think really what stood out beyond that was just the storytelling. Like, I don't know if Jake was how much all of you were involved in like piecing all of that footage, because I'm sure there were just hours and hours and hours of footage. And then, you know, taking that and and honing it down to the story is I think where a lot of the magic happens. A lot of hard work goes into that. And uh uh, that for me that's what stood out a lot it was just an excellent story told you know from beginning to end um i'm just going to share another comment here this is from pascal fournier who's uh uh quite a big youtuber in quebec votre film est vraiment exceptionnel bravo so your film is exceptional bravo thank you pascal i appreciate that yeah, and also merci from, beaucoup. From yeah, thank you very much. France Lavoie, uh, another friend from uh, Montreal, amazing film. Uh, thank you, France. Thank you, Pascal. So let's talk a little bit about um, the logistics of it. Let, let's start with um, Alaska. So <clears throat> uh, I'm going to play a little clip from that let me just cue it up over here just to remind everyone uh video what, evidence yeah what it's what it looked like at the beginning <laughs> we're all doing this for fun we're, we're having fun this is supposed to be fun and enjoyable are you guys actually ready to go i'm just trying to get my fucking visor cleaned up with some heat from my gloves uh that didn't look like fun <laughs> <laughs> at all so in it the video was. in the movie um 
Simon, you said it's like minus 20 degrees. Yeah. Uh, so Fahrenheit. So that's uh, minus 29 degrees Celsius. Yeah. And the wind was howling. It looked like it was blowing everything sideways. So I'm sure with the wind chill, it was probably in the minus 40 range, I'm going to say Celsius anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, did not look like fun at all. Uh, how did you how do you prep for that cold? And how did you how did you guys manage it? Um, wow. Uh, how, how do you prep for that? I, I mean, all of us had been in the military in some Arctic environment in the past, plus uh, in Alaska. So we had been in it before um, and had experience. Um, we had taken the bikes out on Grand Lake in Colorado, which is when it was frozen solid in the middle of winter and and done some preparatory work and, and camped out then. We had some time on the bikes in the cold, not that extreme, but certainly some time. Yeah. Um, and was it fun, Simon? Well, wow. It was type two fun. It was, it, I mean, yeah. it was a blast, but... Yeah, it was work too. It, it was, yeah. there was that, that all that footage is shot on the first day and we were dangerously close to not being able to continue. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm going to interrupt Simon here and, and see if he feels the same way. I, there, <laughs> there's, there's moments in there that were a lot of fun right? Mm -hmm. Like overall, you're kind of miserable and cold and, you know, little things like putting your gloves on or like trying to get the ice off your visor. But then, you know, you go up in, in that particular shot that you showed. Um, what had happened was we had put studs in our, uh, you know, little ice spikes in our tires when we left um, dead horse, which is the nor nor northernmost point. Um, and by the time we got to Adigan Pass, which was where we had stopped, we were having to put new studs in the tires because they had all spun out. Yeah. And the, the rubber had actually gotten so cold that they just they popped out because um, yeah. it wasn't really pliable. And I, I lost my I lost my headlights. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> as soon as you shut the bikes off, you know, it, it starts icing up. And so we had stopped and we were making a decision like, okay, do we want to, <clears throat> do we want to just, you know, pitch a tent and wait for the wind to stop and, and, you know, spend the night here and then go over in the morning. And, um, we got a report from, was it a, I think it was a security guard up there on the highway. Yeah. Yeah. And he said, Hey, look, right on the other side of Adigan pass, the storm's past it's fine the weather's way better over there you're best just to try to make it over the pass so we loaded everything up and we took off and you know in that particular case you know the sun goes down we go up over Adigan pass and the moon comes out and it's cold but you're riding you know four motorcycles riding in the moonlight you know that was amazing I bet, and yeah. <laughs> And it felt really good when we got into camp that night and like got warmed up. But there were some times when we were going through Canada. Um, I think it was uh, the Kazir Highway in the wintertime is amazing. I mean, we yeah. were riding, you know, th there's times where you're riding and your back tires sliding out. And you're just giving it a little more throttle and you're fishtailing down the road. And I mean, there's some there were some some moments of joy in in the Arctic yeah. portion of it for me. Cassier mm -hmm. Highway, we had, and, and even in the Yukon Territory, we had the whole, the road to ourselves. There was nobody else out there. Yeah. Well, of yeah. course. It was just, yeah. yeah. It was awesome. And it was, and it was beautiful. Gorgeous but, country. Yeah. You know, it's only light for four hours. So, <laughs> yeah. And you're, you're out of light and it's cold again. In, in one of the scenes in the, in the film, you stop at a gas station to warm up and you start talking with like another gentleman who was there paying mm -hmm. gas. And he asked you about like how long you ride. And you said something like 200 or 250 miles, I guess, in between. Did you actually ride like in the cold for, for that mm -hmm. amount of time? Or did you like have to take breaks mm -hmm. to like warm up? 
I, I think I just remember going gas tank to gas tank. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. We were pretty much going gas tank to gas tank. So, um, what I wore was, uh, I wore like long johns, my riding gear. And then over the top of that, I had a large Carhartt, um, set of coveralls. And then I think at one point in time, I put my rain jacket over the top of that just to cut the, cut the wind. And then I think actually in Canada, I cut two long strips of, uh, of the sleeping pad and shoved them down my legs mm. to give me like an extra layer in the front to, to block the wind. And then, um, we had heated jackets and heated gloves or I had a heated jacket and heated gloves mm. And then at some point in time, my heated jacket melted, uh, like the wiring melted together. (laughs) So I had to ditch my heated jacket, but my gloves still worked. So I think the fingers were the, for me, the fingers were the hardest part. Yeah. And then I, I remember I had a full on, a full blown Everest quality jacket, but the biggest thing for me was um, just trying to fit everything on. Because yeah. mm-hmm. even if you size things to be that oversized, you can't, you, you just can't fit at, you couldn't put enough clothes on. And the mobility, I'm guessing, right? To like, you know, handle the bike probably yeah. like requires a little extra exertion, right? It's not so comfortable. Well, the, the, the thing that required the most exertion was riding with sidecars. That yeah. is a mm. miserable, miserable, ri- well, part I should say part of it is that we built the sidecars ourselves and they, they were not professionally built sidecars. Um, actually, uh, Simon's brother, Dave built all four of the sidecars for the motorcycles and, um, they were well built, but they didn't handle very well. So that kept you warm muscling those things around corners. Yeah, I guess I have to, I have to send you guys an email with a link to, uh, this other movie that we showed years ago is called uh, AKA Broken Tooth. I don't know if by any chance you ever ran into I've this guy, Oliver Solaro. Mm. Yeah, I've heard of him. Did you guys run I've into heard him? Of him but, uh, I've heard, no, but I've heard of the Broken Tooth Adventures. I think I've okay, seen some of his yeah. stuff. Yeah, he's, um, I've had a chance to like uh, make friends with Oliver because of the film <laughs> festival. And he lives, uh, you know, just a couple of hours outside of Toronto. But he used to, uh, like, he loves taking these long motorcycle trips in the middle of winter. And, you know, he goes to, like, really north, uh, like, northern Ontario or Mm -hmm. Quebec, where there's no roads except for the wintertime when they they ice over. So they become ice roads. And uh, Mm -hmm. like you, he goes on these, like, crazy adventures. And and in one of the films, he mentions Mm -hmm. that his cornea actually like froze so he was losing sight you know it was like middle of the night anyway craziness um margaret (laughs) uh, margaret says thank you gentlemen enjoyed watching your film how did you keep warm margaret i hope that they answered some of that question but if you have something specific uh then pop in with that uh and then got another comment here from isabel hi isabel um uh, this is beautiful the movie and you guys are very inspiring in a way it helped me understand a bit more the mindset of my little brother who's a veteran and he served in afghanistan as well so yeah i think that's um uh, it's nice it's beautiful yeah uh, thank you for your understand. service so um okay uh, we can definitely go into more logistics, uh, so, and if you want, we can do that. But I also want to talk about uh, the um, the storytelling aspect of the film. Um, there's one scene that, like, well, there's there's lots of scenes that stood out for me, but one of them right at the beginning was when uh, Rich got um, into the accident where he got hit by a car that was uh, moving a little bit too fast. And then um, you thought that perhaps he had a broken leg as a result. And Hmm. so all of you pull over to the side of the road and uh, Simon, you looked after him. And um, I just want to share this like uh, tender moment and then I'll come back with some questions. Sorry, dude. Sorry, dude. Thank you. 
you're allowed. Okay, you're totally allowed. Totally allowed. When you're deployed, if you get pulled out for some reason, you generally have dreams about having left your bugs. I love that part of the film. Um, <clears throat> I love it for a couple of reasons. One is um, from a filmmaker perspective, Jake or whoever was doing the editing sort of just left this moment to sit there. Like it's a little bit uncomfortable, if you will, like the silence of it all. Just, you know, you, Simon and Rich having this like intimate moment where he's going through this hard time because he feels that he's like letting you guys down and he just sort of like lets that hang there almost a little too long you know how when there's quiet times you want to like jump in and say something so he just lets that sit there so it like sinks into us uh, i think that's like so well done beautiful but also i enjoyed it because um it's real it's the you know very real emotion that we can all relate to and almost in a way it gives us a regular folks uh permission to have these moments you know like we some especially as guys and maybe as as, as uh, armed forces uh individuals you know you have to be tough you, you guys i'm sure are tough motherfuckers uh and uh it gives you this moment to say that it's okay to also you know experience these these emotions um, one of the one of the things that i experienced is and I, I think wayne probably can can add similar experiences in the military is you'll guys that would get hurt or wounded wouldn't want to be cared for they would you know, no, I'm okay. I can let me go back on the line or whatever it would be. And it'd be like, no, you really like, you gotta, you gotta relax a minute and, and help us, let us take care of you. That would be hard to, to convince most of the soldiers that I worked with were very professional and they would, they wouldn't even admit that they were hurt. It's like, yeah, a lot yeah. of times it would, it would take really convincing them that the best thing to do for their buddies was to get pulled out to get get patched up that was yeah sometimes hard to do what i what i really love about that scene i think is um is that it gives it, it kind of does give you a look at the sort of the human aspect of of whether it's being in the military or doing a motorcycle trip, you know, you're, it's humans behind it. Right. And I think a lot of times people look out, they have a, they have a concept in their mind of what they think people in the military are like, whether, you know, military or, or police or firefighters, <clears throat> they think, well, these, you know, these military people are, you know, they're, they're, they're mindless. They just do what they're told. They're emotionless. They're, you know, they're, they're, you know, robotic in a sense. And what I like about that scene is that it kind of shows you that <laughs> like, no, I mean, there's a lot of human emotion, right? And when you're in the military and, you know, you deploy overseas, I mean, you're scared, you're nervous, um, you're worried, you're sad, you know, you're all of those things, but you go and do your job anyway, or you go and, and stay, um, you, you know, you stay on the mission despite all of those human feelings. And, you know, that uh, uh, it was an unfortunate incident that, you know, that he got hit by a, a car. But I really appreciate the fact that, you know, Jake being a filmmaker, like you said, you know, he he just stayed on that moment you know, and it didn't ask anybody, you know, how are you feeling or anything like that? He just let that moment kind of happen. And, yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I, I, 
so the comment that Rich had at that moment, which was, you know, in the army, I forgot now exactly what he said, but I'm paraphrasing that if you get pulled out of like a mission, you feel like you let your, your buddies down. Um, that like as a civilian, that was like eye opening for me because I would have thought, right. oh, Rich is probably upset because, <clears throat> you know, he can't continue on his mission. But no, Rich was, you know, I'm sure there was a part of that, but he was thinking about letting you guys down. Um, which, that's beautiful. I think that I'm assuming comes out of that, that army experience working together as a team. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, Fran says that scene was extremely touching. Yes, it was. Okay. So um, <clears throat> let's move away into a little bit uh, warmer climates. <laughs> so you guys uh, make your way down through <coughs> the Canada and the United States and Mexico. Um, and then, so the story moves quickly, and then we get to to the Darien, and um, this is where the movie turns uh, a little bit funny, I think, for us as as <laughs> viewers. I don't yeah. know why, but I guess we really love seeing people suffer for some reason yeah. because let me tell you when we were watching the film whether it was toronto montreal calgary there were moments where you guys were suffering where yeah we were like you know dumbfounded like it's unbelievable what you guys went through but at the same time it was also kind of funny as well i'm sure it wasn't funny for you in the moment <laughs> It's funny now. <laughs> <Is Yeah. it? laughs> there were funny there were funny moments, you know. I think there's this there's a scene in there where Jake asks me a question. He's like, you know, you got you have to remember Jake at the time is twenty two years old, maybe. Mm. Simon, do you remember he, he's he's twenty two or twenty four or something old. like that? Yeah, and he's uh, and we're all you know over forty five, right? I think I'm the youngest of the four riders, so he's he's easily half of our age, and we're trudging through the jungle, and he's you know running around basically. I mean, that's all yeah. of that Darien Gap footage is one guy running around with a camera, and the motorcycles are spread out over a mile distance because you know some of us we're able to ride a little bit and then we had to get bogged down with mud and then we'd push and pull. And, and so we got, got pretty spread out and Jake is just running back and forth. And <clears throat> there's one scene in there where he's asking me questions and I can hear it in my voice that I'm irritated. Mm -hmm. And as soon as it cuts away is when I slip and fall on my butt and tumble <laughs> down this muddy bank and i'm cussing and i i don't think it that obviously didn't make it into the film i think he he cut it right there because and after that you're like you know that's pretty funny <laughs> you know there were some funny moments but it's much more entertaining to look back on it than it was while we were I'm there sure well for for us i think a lot of the funny moments came seeing the reactions from either the the people at Santa yeah, or yeah. the Akuna, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, <laughs> when one of you would say something, and then the Akuna would be like, "What? <laughs> yeah, uh, you're gonna keep going? What? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I got sure. a clip. I got a clip of that just to sh to highlight exactly what I mean. <laughs> well, the only, I mean. Um, we would, well, I guess we could <laughs> technically push and pull the bikes all the way to <laughs> Colombia. That, yeah, the audience was roaring at that point, let me tell you, that was yeah. hilarious. And there was a couple of moments like that. Yeah. I mean, not to detract from them at all, but I think their expectation was that we would not make it a day. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. When we, you know, they, a lot of their family members followed us out of the village the first day into the first camp the first night. And I was looking around going, 
Wayne, we have food for 17 people. There's 32 people here tonight. We don't, we're not going to make it with the food yeah. we have, but they're only a mile, you know, two or three miles from their village. They know they can walk home and they will, but that night they were going to enjoy our food. Right. They're expecting <laughs> us not to continue. I think. Right. <clears throat> Did they yeah, ever the try to like deter you guys from going? Well, the, so the other dynamic, the other dynamic that was in play was, um, so we had the Kuna Indian on the Panamanian side and the Wunan Indians on the Colombian side. And uh, the guide, the guy that's kind of like at the very end of that clip, he's wearing, he actually showed up with a, he had had shirts made that said um, Darien Gap Expedition or something like that. It was pretty crazy. Um, like we showed up and he had these shirts printed up. Um but uh, he wanted us to get through very quickly. Like he was worried about the um, the FARC on the Colombian side. He was worried about drug smugglers. There's a lot of human trafficking, a lot of drug smuggling going back and forth. So we had that dynamic of him wanting to really push us along. Um, you had the, the Wunan Indians on the Colombian side that they would only work from the Colombian border into Colombia and the Kuna would only work from Paya, the village of Paya, to the border. So the Wunan Indians wanted us, you know, because they were going to, they would get some some money out of it. Um, yeah, it was a very interesting dynamic. I mean, uh, like Simon said, I think we started out with like 35, 40 people. Pretty much every kid from the village followed, followed along. Um, and then by day two, that was just, everybody was gone. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, do you remember when we got to Cristalis, the village on the other side in the Columbia side, and they had to talk to the FARC to see if we could stay there overnight? That was like, I was like, we're, if they decide we can't stay, we're. What do we do? Yeah, we're. <laughs> yeah. So, is the word I'm thinking of. I was like, we're, we're, we're screwed. We're like, what are we going to do? Like we, I don't know how we can get out of here. Yeah. So if, if you, if you look at the, you know, if you look at a map of the Darien, it's first of all, there's not a lot of maps of the area, but <clears throat> essentially what we did was we rode the motorcycles to um, Yavisa, which is where the road ends. We put the bikes on dugout canoes and we went from Yavisa up to the village of Paya. Paya is the last village the last kuna village before you start into the land crossing of the darien gap <clears throat> it's um i don't know it's it's maybe 10 15 miles to the colombian border it's not very far the the kuna walk can you can walk from paya to the colombian border you know very easily it's a ten, it's a 10 15 mile hike you know you they, they take tourists there you know bird watchers and things it's pretty easy to walk it um and then once you get to the colombian border it's another 10 or so miles um until you reach a place on the river where you can actually get a canoe so <clears throat> you're really only crossing about a 40 mile stretch well, no, probably 20, 20 to 25 mile stretch of actual jungle. Hmm. And, but that's the hard bit <laughs> yeah. because it's a single track, not even a single track. I mean, it's, you know, there's down to trees, there's vines growing everywhere. So you're kind of cutting and hacking a path. And then in, in our case, we timed it so that the reason why we went through Alaska and Canada in the wintertime was we wanted to get there during the dry season. But <clears throat> I think we ended up, we showed up on January 10th, I think, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. totally and it yeah. rained every single day. Um, mm -hmm. So it was not as dry as we, it was, as we were expecting. So then you get a lot of mud built up in the tires of the bikes and things like that. And so you know, that led to the clutch problems and it led yeah. to uh, Rich's bike going down, Rich having difficulty riding and it just kind of snowballed. Um, but once you get to the Colombian border, it's sort of all downhill. Uh, and then once you get 
once you uh, get far enough into Columbia where you can pick up a river, then we got boats and we hauled the bikes down to the first village on the Colombian side, which is Cristalas. <clears throat> and we didn't know at the time, but Cristalas is sort of where the Colombian drug trafficking <laughs> sort of starts. Um, yeah. And yeah, that was, a, that was, a, that's a whole nother adventure that didn't even make it into the film, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so question, were you guys scared any time regarding the smugglers and so on? Did you run into that? I, I was, uh, I don't think we, I, we didn't knowingly encounter any, let's put it that way. Um, Crystallis, when they went to the FARC rebels to ask permission to allow us to stay overnight, I was like, if they decide to come into this village and not let us stay or kidnap us or whatever, we're, we're kind of powerless because we were completely exhausted and we had nowhere to go. Yeah. I was a little bit concerned there when we got out to the river and we hired those guys to smuggle us into turbo that got a little sketchy there. I wasn't scared, but it was like, this is, this is dumb. This is really dumb. Mm. You know? Yeah. So, so what Simon's talking, what Simon's talking about is, um, I mean, I think just in general, the Darien gap has, uh, has kind of a reputation, right? Yeah. So it's a little unnerving when you, you take your motorcycle that you've been riding around for, two months and you can go, I want to go that direction. I want to go that direction. I want to stop. I want to go back. You, you lock yourself into the daring gap. You put your bike on a boat and you're in kind of somebody else's hands. Right. And then when you get into Paya, you know, you're on that trail and you know, everybody's using it. Um, it's the easiest way to get back and forth and sure. Santa front, you know, they're out patrolling. They're the Panamanian border patrol. Um, so you just have that heightened sense of uh, a little bit of stress, but when we got into the Colombian side, it was really, I mean, that was sort of an unknown for all of us. Mm-hmm. And, uh, like Simon was saying, you know, first thing, the first village we come to, they're like, well, yeah, you can, they, they can, you know, the village elders left, left us sitting in a hut waiting and then they came back like two hours later and they're like, okay, they said that you can stay for the night, but you have to be out at eight in the morning and you can't fly your drone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're like, okay, no problem. So we had a really stressful night of sleep. I think we were out on the beach packed and ready to go at like 7 a.m. We we're like, let's get out of here. <laughs> um, but, <clears throat> yeah, so, but but you can only travel on the river for so long and then you hit what's called the Atrato Swamp. And that's where the water goes from three feet deep to, I mean, it thins down into just a couple inches of water. Yeah. And then that's why the Colombian military doesn't go up there is because they can't get their big river boats up there. Mm-hmm. So, so we ended up dragging and pushing and pulling and getting the bikes uh, through the Atrato swamp into kind of deeper water. And, um, and then once that, <laughs> once that happened, we, we felt somewhat relieved until, um, we got actually out into the Atrato river itself. Um, we had to convince the Colombian military that we were legitimate. Like we had, like we're pointing at the mountains. We're like, no, we just went that we just came from the jungle and they were, you know, they were a little, um, shocked belief maybe, but yeah, <laughs> but you know, yeah, then for we sure. Thought, because now we had four broken motorcycles or three broken motorcycles at that point. And the plan changed because now we had to get these bikes to turbo, which if you look at the map, you have to cross a a pretty good sized body of water in open bay. And um, yeah, we ended up hiring a, a pretty, a pretty sketchy boat captain. Um, I mean, pirate is the word you're looking for. (laughs) Pirate. (laughs) He was a pirate. (laughs) Yeah. We're like, and then and now, and by now it's dark. We load everything onto this boat, and it was it was kind of like out of Pirates of the Caribbean. I mean, you're going down the river, and you see lights along the side, and you see like little villages and stuff, and you can hear music, and and the 
guy driving the boat just has one guy up on the bow with a little flashlight. <laughs> He's looking yep. to see where you're going. And we were like, oh, my God, this is – I think that was probably the most dangerous part of the entire yeah. trip. And do you, remember, the... do you remember we stopped? There was some river <laughs> checkpoint. We stopped. It was like <laughs> – Yeah. It was like – it was like out of some Vietnam movie. It was like they had a river gunboat sitting there and they were watching soccer on TV and yeah. on a floating like building that was like a pub or something. And then we pulled up and they were like, they wrote in it, they hand wrote us a note saying you're okay to go, but you do so at your own risk. And we're like, yeah, okay. This is like they a handed, little, uh, they made us all sign it. Yeah, I mean, I saw sign it. We're like, okay, whatever. And then we went across the bay with no lights, no navigation. And then he stopped in the middle and they're like, they're all looking around and they're like, oh, yeah, I think this is the way. And <laughs> off we go. I'm like, okay. Wow. And all I can think of is if this boat turns over, we're going to go to the bottom with all these bikes. There's no way we'll get out from underneath them. Yeah. Just wow. crazy. I would have been okay. I had a life jacket and I was sitting on Yeah, the me too. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, I'm sure, I mean, it's, uh, I'm sure it was tense, those moments and unnerving. Um, you don't know what's real, I'm sure, right? And you, I'm assuming, like, could feel that at any moment, you can have this whole crew of individuals just on top of you. But just the sense that it could have gone either way. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I think people are generally really friendly and helpful and, and nice and, and, the, these guys are businessmen, right? It's, it's good for business if they deliver you to where you paid them mm -hmm. to have you brought. So they, they know the game, but it was sense. it could have gone either way pretty rapidly, I think. Yeah. How do you plan for something like this? Like obviously traveling from Northern Alaska to, you know, all the way to Panama, no problem. You can plan. You got maps, you got Google Earth, you got, you know, you can speak with people. How do you plan from Colorado, where you're at, um, that journey through the Darien? Did you have to go down there in advance to do some like recon or yeah. how does that happen? Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's really interesting. So like you said, you can, you know, you can Google search, you, you can Google search pretty much anywhere in the world. Um, but when you start searching for information on the Darien, it's very difficult. Um, it's kind of like, you know, trying to research how to get from uh, India and Nepal up into Tibet, right? The information <clears throat> gets really sketchy. Um, it's, there's a lot of conflicting information out there. And the Darien Gap is, is, is way more intense than that. I mean, there's a ton of misinformation out there, um, even while we were actually doing the trip or had just gotten back from the trip, there were people, you know, posting stuff and asking questions and saying things like, Oh no, it's not possible. You can't go through there. I mean, there's a lot of misinformation. So what we ended up doing, um, well, I actually, to, to plan the Darien part of it, we did go down uh, the year prior. Um, we did a trip down to Panama uh, my wife is Colombian and she went with us and actually did a lot of the translation because the, the Kuna actually speak their own language and Spanish and then some English. So um, we did a, a trip uh, prior to the actual um, expedition. <clears throat> we, um, we went down just so that we could kind of get a feel for, you know, what the actual environment was. Uh, you know, when you say dugout canoes, like, what do you mean? Like, is this the actual dugout canoe? You know, we were taking measurements and making sure stuff would fit. Yeah. And um, uh, so, yeah, you, the, for the Darien Gap portion of it, it kind of started with reading books about it. And then I actually called around and started uh, interviewing people. Um, Patty Upton, uh, Lauren and Patty Upton were two uh, travelers that um, spent a lot of time in the Darien. I think Patty was... Uh, I think she lived in Panama for a long time and, um, that may have been how she met Lauren, I believe, but she's, she's actually the only woman that I know that actually rode, she rode a Rokon motorcycle 
from like Paya to Columbia. Like, so she like legitimately rode a motorcycle through the Daring Gap. Um, but yeah, Lauren and Patty Upton, I talked to Bob Webb, who had been a, a gold miner down there back in the seventies. Um, and you know, I got maps from them. I got drawings. Um, uh, yeah, you just, you just start piecing the information together. And then I think we got to the point where I had as much information as I could, but, uh, when, and, and we probably would have just gone and done it. But um, once Jake came on board and wanted to make a documentary film about the trip, I think that was the point where we decided, okay, we, now we have a little bit more riding on it. It's not just for four friends going out on a motorcycle ride. Now it's going to, we're going to try to make a documentary <laughs> film out of this. We put more effort into researching the Darien Gap. We went down and talked to, uh, so there's three different groups of people that you have to get permission from to cross the Daring Gap. The first one is Senefront, and they're the Border Patrol, um, and they are the least committal of the of the three groups. Uh, you have to get permission from the Darien National Park because the whole area is is actually a national park. But when you go talk to both of those organizations, they say, "Well, what you really need is permission from the Kuna themselves." So we went down the year prior and met with the chiefs and met with the guides and all the people and got their permission to come back the next year with motorcycles. So that was kind of the three hurdles that we had to, um, that we had to jump to, to get permission to go down there. But Massive I don't know, that's a long winded answer to your question. No, no, it's perfect. I mean, uh, we don't get to see any of that for us, you know, as viewers, we just start following you, you know, from mm -hmm. Alaska down and we don't get to see everything that goes behind the scenes. Uh, it's a massive undertaking. You know, just um, from a medical point of view, we had to be prepared for frostbite and sub-zero cold. We had to be right. prepared for all the jungle illnesses and, and, and issues that can occur in, in the jungle, including trench foot, which happened to Wayne. We had to be <laughs> prepared for um, um, yeah, the Atacama Desert, one of the out. driest places in the world, dehydration and all the other situations that came in that, plus car accidents, motorcycle accidents, plus almost all of us, except for the camera crew, were older. So the cardiac issues, the, the issues that go along with being a little bit more advanced in age. So just preparing medically was a pretty massive undertaking. Just even prophylaxis against malaria, um, making sure all our shots and immunizations were up to date. Um, it was that just that alone was occupied a, a lot of time that, that isn't, a, it doesn't appear in the film, of course. I bet. I bet. Uh, yeah, well, wanna, you guys now are a, a, Oh, sorry. I, I want to make a shout out. I, I mentioned that Jake was, um, was running around in the jungle with us, but, uh, we also had Alex Mann who was, um, a former special forces, uh, enlisted guy and he was taking still photographs so okay. yeah we had to mm -hmm. i wanted to get mention his name in there too <laughs> yeah definitely anyway yeah just an incredible amount of research and work that uh, you guys put into into making this happen uh, hopefully it's documented somewhere or people can reach out to you if they ever want to for whatever reason uh you know do it again amazing yeah. thank you uh, a question from John Five Cooper. Did you talk to Helge Peterson? Uh, uh, that's, Peterson? It's actually funny. I met him uh, in 19... When did I meet him? 89, I think. I met him in Boulder, Colorado at uh, Mike's Camera. Um, and I was riding a BMW at the time. And I had a, just a briefest of conversation with him. And I've ran into him a few times at some BMW rallies. But we've never had a conversation. I have never had a conversation with him about crossing the gap, although I know he has done it. Hmm. Yeah, there's a um, there's a handful of people that have have crossed um, the Daring Gap with their motorcycles. I like I said, I think Patty and um, Bob, Patty uh, Upton and Bob Webb are the only ones that I think could claim to have ridden the Darien Gap. <laughs> Yeah. And that's because they were on two wheel drive Rokons. Um, Hellgate would be, pretty much had to, had to do what we did, drag yeah. it the majority yeah. of the way. And so, so Hellgate Peterson, um, I think he was one of probably the first maybe 
or one of the first, uh, certainly to cross the Daring Gap with a motorcycle. And mm-hmm. then um, Ed Culberson, um, he did it the same direction we did. He was heading uh, uh, north to south. <laughs> and then um, Antonio Braga, who was, uh, who's, I want to say he's Peruvian, but um, don't quote me on that. Uh, he went from south to north. And I'm probably missing. Danny Liska said he did it, but there's sort that's of right. no documentation that he actually yeah. did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so that's the interesting thing is, um, you know, as far as the only people that I know to have taken a video camera was Expedition de las Americas. Um, and that was that Jeep expedition with Tim Steigen. And, and you can actually see that video on youtube uh Mm. if you google search it and they they have some video footage of it it's it's short it's maybe 20 minutes long yeah i think i think the land rover guys and i think the are what's that car called Uh, oh the court the corvair yeah the corvair i think they have some stuff but not actually a full production yeah so that was one of our goals was to actually like you know get some pretty good video footage of it. Cause I think that's, you know, <laughs> that's, a, it's a rare opportunity to get some, yeah. some rare footage. Yeah. And, uh, but like you were saying, we're only seeing such a small portion of what actually transpired. Like, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I, we're, we we're, we're at an guy. hour mark, so I don't want to like take up too much of your time. I, I really appreciate the fact that you're with us, but I mean, I could just go on, and ask 101 questions about the planning and the logistics and how did you sleep at night? Where did you sleep at night? How did you deal with the bugs? And uh, apparently like yeah. venomous uh, frogs and scorpions and uh, yeah, on and on. And But I got to ask this question because everyone asks me this question and I don't know the answer is. You, you know what it is, Simon? Oh, I'm sure I know what it is. Yeah. How come you didn't bring any spare clutch plates? Uh, <laughs> Simon doesn't want to answer that question. I, I, I have my <laughs> own opinion about why we didn't, but that's... Well, okay, so I get asked this question a lot too, right? Um, sure. And, it's, it, and we, t- we, have, we have talked about this uh, quite a bit as well. Um. So when we went into the Darien, the, the, I had mentioned that we went on the trip before, right? The year before we went down there. And in uh, December, so we went right after Christmas, we went down there. So it was like January 1st, somewhere around there. And it was bone dry. The rivers were low. And mm-hmm. it, walking across the mud was like walking on pavement. Yeah. Right? So the... Um, what we had envisioned in our head, I think, was that we were going to be riding until we hit an obstacle, clear the obstacle, ride a little bit more. And then when we hit a big hill, we would push, pull and drag and ride combination up the hill. Right. So the, the first thing, you know, the weather didn't didn't cooperate. So um, that's one, you know, m- mitigating factor. The other thing is like I've ridden thousands of miles on motorcycles and never changed the clutch plate. We didn't anticipate the fact that having sidecars on the motorcycles, because none of us have had sidecars before. Um, I think the sidecars did a lot of wear and tear on yeah. the clutches because yeah. the bikes themselves only had maybe 6,000 miles on them at the time. It wasn't a lot of mileage. Um, yeah. Maybe it was, t- maybe it was as much as 10,000, but, um, but we had, I mean, we had, uh, spare cables a spare chain a spare sprocket we had um we had a spare radiator fan which we needed yeah Mm. yeah we had stuff that we thought we would break along the way um you know we thought okay if we're riding along and we dump the bike and we jam the you know the radiator or jam a log into the radiator how can we fix it well we can't really reliably fix it so like we had had brainstormed all that yeah and man, clutch plates. Like and, and, never... I, and my thought on it is we had a pretty, a very extensive spares package. Um, we didn't bring in the gap because we weren't going to carry it, but we had an extensive pair of 
spares package. I think in the razzmatazz of getting ready to go and trying to prepare everything, I don't think I, I had the thought to go and look at it and I to make sure I had my own eyes on it. And I, I think we just, just escaped this, you know, yeah. but I think we brought a lot of other stuff that we needed that doesn't appear in the movie. And that, <laughs> you know, yeah. Isn't that always the really way, a lot of the bases covered a whole lot of them covered, not that one. Yeah. But yeah I think, we did, like we did I think that's sort of part of the things. honesty in the film is that, yeah, we showed that. Yeah, you're right. We didn't have it. Yeah. You know? No, but I mean the, the, it's a good answer. Thank you for answering. I mean, the, yeah. the dry roads, you know, from your previous experience and what you had planned, plus the yeah. spares. There's always going to be something. Uh, and you I, know, I, I personally thought we would find sure more plates, Kawasaki dealership else. support in uh, in South and Central America. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that proved not to be the case. That was difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm going to uh, wrap it up. Um, I just want to have uh, show one last clip from the film, which was another really standout moment for me, which is when you got all the way to the end of your trip and you talk about um, sort of reflecting back as to what you hoped you'd get out of this trip and whether that materialized or not. I was expecting to see some kind of sign, I guess. I was hoping there'd be some revelation about why I came on the trip and what was going to be different. The same kind of demons that helped me decide to go on this trip are still there. It will easily be the hardest part of this trip for me to go home. A lot of people said, oh, that's a trip of a lifetime. Doing stuff like this isn't going to give you the life satisfaction that you're looking for. There's no one trip that's going to be like, yes, now my life is complete. You got to find that enjoyment in everything you do, you know, right where you're at. That was another really great, uh, touching moment. Um, I think so many of us, um, and maybe that's part of our human makeup. I know for myself, you know, you, you go out and you try to do something, accomplish something, go on a trip or, or an adventure. Um, and you're hoping that when you do that, some light bulb moment will happen some realization, um, some life lesson, and then it never does, uh, exactly like you were saying, Simon. Uh, mm -hmm. And it is so true. And then, Wayne, you mentioned that it's not about this one thing. It's about all of the combination of all of these moments. Can you talk a little bit, both of you, about, about that? And did you all feel... Not let down, but was it all a little bit anticlimactic at the end for all of you guys? Uh, yeah, I think I think for me, I I had um, the sense that I wasn't maybe gonna make the best choice by going home afterwards. Um, uh, there's a, some line in the movie where I comment about how am I going to live a life that's not full of adventure after this, you know, and um, that it's true. What I said, my demons are still here. Um, not as close as I thought they would be. I'm definitely managing to keep them at arm's reach. Um, and uh, my girlfriend and I have a young son now, so my life is definitely full of adventure, Congratulations. Um, but I'm still motorcycling, still racing, still planning more adventures. I think it, I get very upset when people say, oh, that was a trip of a lifetime. Cause I don't think so. Um, we're, you know, Wayne and I are constantly planning new adventures and new trips. And I, I would love to do another 
prolonged trip. Um, I don't think it's going to change anything in my life. I am always going to be living, I don't know, unconventional adventure. Fine with that. Is it more about the actual journey than the destination, I guess, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 yeah I mean, Ushuaia I think... is just a spot on the map. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think for me, um, you know, I have two teenagers and when I got back from the trip, um, you know, I, I like it, it's kind of like it's it's kind of like a military deployment, right? Like you have an ex, you have an expectation in your head, you go and you do it and it's it's, you know, good in some ways, bad in other ways, but it's never exactly what you thought it was going to be. Um, this trip was as great. Absolutely. You know, had a great time. Uh, the good and the bad, um, wonderful memories. But, but, you know, I, I realized when I got home that, you know, j I get, I get that same satisfaction going out and doing a two week trip. You know, my son, when I got back from, from this trip, my son was, I guess he was 17 at the time. He said, Hey dad, I want to learn how to ride motorcycles. I was like, okay, cool. I've been trying to get him to ride motorcycles for years. We went out and did a, um, you know, a short like seven day motorcycle trip in the back country. And then we went and rented motorcycles and, and in Iceland and, you know, and, and then, and then my daughter, you know, she came to me, you know, just a little while ago and said, I want to learn how to ride a motorcycle. So, I mean, I found uh, just as much enjoyment out of that as I would, as I found on a, a big long trip challenging myself to go through the daring gap so the big realization for me was like oh i can do, you know <laughs> like i had a great time riding a motorcycle with my son across the state that i live in you know i didn't need to go uh from alaska to argentina to get to get mm -hmm. that same sense of adventure and that same joy so and i i think from a from a filmmaker perspective um making the movie was great but there was a lot of work that that occurred after we came back mostly with Wayne and and Jay Camby um but that was that's just work it's not exciting <laughs> or interesting it's just a lot of work no oh, yeah definitely yeah. absolutely uh just to piggyback on what you were saying though Wayne about uh these other places where you can find that same uh feeling as I'm going on this trip, but I'm just going to guess that you guys enjoy pushing the boundaries of or trying to find the boundaries of what you're capable of. I'm just going to guess that that's part of your personalities, maybe, um, you know, trying to see just how far you can go, what you can endure um you know the mind over matter mind over the body sort of thing um is do you think that that's a part of you oh i definitely think that's a huge part of my makeup and i i really enjoy the fact that i my appearance is like this and uh, my age and uh, you know whatever and i go and do stuff and people go what that guy does that really yeah I think I think it's more so for Simon than it is for me. He's okay. a little bit more of a, a boundary pusher. Um, I guess I'm I get a little bit more enjoyment out of the team cohesion, planning and logistics. Simon's uh, definitely a little bit more on the edge than I am. But uh, and you can you whenever we're riding motorcycles, you usually can't see him. We had this problem when we were trying to get like shots. Like you can't see him because he's going too fast, and I'm like <laughs> poking along and keep keep trying to keep everybody together. But yeah, um, yeah. I th but I mean, there is still a little bit of it. I mean, I'm not going to climb Everest, but I do like to go out and see <laughs> see how much pain and suffering I can endure before I call it quits. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> I get that. I get that. All right, I'm going to wrap up. Uh, thank you again, both, so much. Um, I really, really appreciate you taking the time. I thank you uh, for making the film. 
and sharing it with us uh, means a lot. Uh, it's funny. In 2020, we had this other film on our on our uh, film festival called When the Road Ends. And it was about this guy, Dylan <laughs> with Rama, who rode down um, the coast. And when he got to the Darien, he made a raft that he powered yeah. with his yeah. motorcycle. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah. To, like, you know, <laughs> get over to Colombia. Anyway, he got lost at sea for a long time. You know, his life was on the edge as well as a result of that. But when I was researching um, about that film, I came across an article uh, that was about you guys uh, and your experience at the time. I don't even remember where I read that, but there was uh, obviously words and there was like photographs. And I thought, yeah. this is insane. Like, I remember seeing this one picture where I think, Simon, it was your bike was like hung with like some rope and it was just like <laughs> sort of yeah. like going down, I don't know, across a river or something like that. And yeah. it was just nuts. And so it's amazing that here we are two years later, you know, uh, you've got your film and we're chatting over here about it. So it's pretty awesome. Thank you again. Um, Thank you. Yeah, thanks for inviting us. This has been great. Yeah, pleasure. Yep, and thank you, everybody, who chimed in with right. some comments. I'm just going to pop the last couple uh, up here. Um, so just thank you. Margaret wants to know if there's a director's cut of this movie. I'd love to see some outtakes oh. or some of these <laughs> uh, other Ooh. tough parts that, that you know we didn't get to see. And then last one. I would, one, I would uh, love from... a director's cut. And, yeah. Um, yeah. We'll, we will keep that in the conversation. Uh, yeah. Because, yeah, there's, I mean, I, I want to say there was, I mean, there's at least 100 hours of footage. Oh, yeah. I, mean, yeah. I think that's one of the most frustrating months. things for us is we know what's not in there. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, yeah. Yeah. But you know what? Uh, it's just the right amount yeah. anymore. Yeah. It can get too long. It right. could drag. It's just the right amount. Got to keep yeah. us, uh, you know, hanging and wanting more. I think it yeah. was good. Last comment from Robin. He rides a Ural and yellow knife at minus 40. And he oh. goes, you guys are nuts. Oh, so there you go. <laughs> Urals. Yeah. 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 All right. Thank you again. Um, Thank you, everyone. And we thank will you. Talk, talk to you guys soon. Yeah.